Kelly Lester's story is one that covers so many of the difficult and painful topics in our world today. Child molestation, raped as a teen, several abortions, drug dealing, eating disorders, homosexuality, pornography, prostitution, and even working at the abortion clinic where she had her first abortion. But as she says, beauty triumphs from the ashes, and Kelly is a testament to how God can clean all the dirty parts of a painful life story and make it brand new. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Pro-Life Guys podcast. We have a, a, a a fantastic conversation for you today with Kelly Lester. My name is Peter. I'm the host of the show. And with me again is my good friend, my wonderful co-host, and my well-bearded <laughs> legend friend, Cameron Gote. Hello, sir. Hey, uh, good to be here. As always, I'm glad that my beard came back and made an appearance as well. And I'm fired up for this episode, Peter. This is a, a tough one. And this is going to be a tough one for a lot of our listeners, as you mentioned in that kind of opening statement. Uh, there's a lot of heavy stuff that we're going to get into today. Um, I've been listening to a, a ton of different content, whether it's speeches at March for Life, whether it's speeches at 40 Days for Life or other um testimonies that Kelly has given. It's a powerful, beautiful story, but there, um, as with so many beautiful stories, there's there's a lot of darkness in it. And so um, fair warning to our audience that, that there's some heavy to um, topics, but this is an abortion related podcast. And so I'm sure that you're assuming that anyways. Um, but no, I, I'm really um, excited to dive into this because I think that she has a tremendous amount of of value to offer to your audience, Peter, even to you and I, because of the journey that she has been on and, and the amazing work that she's doing now. Yeah, that's right. Before I uh, introduce her any further, if this is your first time listening to the program, thank you so much for tuning in. We are two guys who are passionate about ending the killing of preborn children in Canada. And this podcast is dedicated to giving people the tools that they need, giving you the tools that you need to change minds, to save lives, and to work towards the ultimate transformation of our culture. If you uh, are not a Patreon supporter, if you want to support the podcast, help us to reach more people with good pro-life apologetics, you can find us patreon.com slash pro-life guys. That's patreon.com slash pro-life guys. Be part of the movement, not just the movement of exposing the abortion industry, not just the movement of um, you know pushing forward pro-life content, but getting the good, solid, street-tested, time-tested, pro-life apologetics and that sort of content to the world prolifeguys.com slash no 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 patreon.com slash prolife guys all right kelly lester is our uh guest today we had a, a very profound conversation with her um i shared a little bit about the beginning of her journey in the opening quote on the top of the show she is now a wife and a mother of six children she loves to st to share her story of how god um went into her desperate situation and saved her and how he can do that to anybody. She is currently a client advocate for Loveline Ministries. She's the director of Outreach for And Then There Were None, uh, which most of you would know as the organization that Abby Johnson founded and uh, works with Pro Love Ministries. And she's a board member for Village Ansem Living Stones Ministries. This is our conversation with Kelly Lester. Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us on the podcast today. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited. This is my first international podcast because I'm in the United States. I know you guys are, are the first, so I'm very excited about this. Wonderful. That's great. We are honored to be um, hosting your first international uh, conversation on a podcast now, Kelly, we are excited to learn more about your work with And Then There Were None and Pro Love Ministries and some of the other things you do as well. But before we get there, we understand that you have a very profound story when it comes to um, sort of your history, your testimony, um, your involvement with abortion and just um, some of the things that you've been through. So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit of your testimony as we dive into this conversation, which will really set the stage for some of the important work that you do today. Yeah, thank you. So 
My story um, is, a, is a definitely a crazy one. I tell people when I think about my story, it's like watching an after school special, you know, a movie that wasn't my life. But I, I grew up in a Christian home. My dad um, was a lay pastor. My parents were married up until the point my dad passed away a few months ago. Um, and, but the whole time growing up, I just, I felt shame. And when I was three, four years old, I remember doing inappropriate things with dolls and not your normal child exploratory things, but actual sexual acts. Um, and then in kindergarten, I mean, kindergarten in elementary school and in middle school, I was teased really badly by the kids and bullied. Um, and again, I just felt shame. Fast forward a little bit further to high school, and I was a young high schooler. I was 12 when I was a freshman in high school, and some girls that I, I played sports with um, were going to a party. They had spent the night at my house, and they said, hey, you want to sneak out and go to this party? And I'd never done anything like that, but I was looking for attention, you know, and really just wanting to fit in. And so I did. I snuck out, went to the party, and at the party, I was raped. Um, by one of the more popular boys in the school. And afterwards, I told some of my friends and no one believed me because they said, why would he need to do that to you? He could have anybody he wanted. And I went to my youth pastor and I told her what had happened. And her response was, well, if you'd never snuck out and gone to that party, that would have never happened. And so obviously both of those just added to the shame that I had grown up with. And, and I was convinced that, you know, I was a bad person and I wanted attention and I wanted love. And so I became promiscuous. And by the time I was 15, I was pregnant. And I, we went and told my boyfriend's mom that I was pregnant and she said, no problem. I'm going to take you to our local abortion clinic and we'll take care of it. And I walked into that abortion clinic, a straight A student. I was a nationally ranked tennis player. We were in church every time the doors were open. We had home group at my house and I walked out and I quit playing tennis nearly immediately. I barely finished my senior year of high school. My grades dropped terribly and I started drinking and doing drugs. And it didn't take long before I was actually selling drugs and was running drugs up and down the East Coast of the United States, um, doing the rave scene and the Grateful Dead scene. And um, with that came every kind of depravity you can imagine, from homosexuality to domestic violence, eating disorders, you name it, I have been through it and have a badge saying I did it really well. And I did that for years. Um, and in the middle of that, because of the chaos of my life, I wanted to stop bartending and stop doing drugs and, you know, stop selling drugs and wanted to find a good job. And so I looked in my local newspaper and saw that our local women's clinic was hiring. And I went to this women's clinic and it was where I had had an abortion. And I went in and I applied. Now, this was 20 years ago. And again, I know that Canadian American dollars are a little different, but 20 years ago, as a receptionist, I was getting paid $18 an hour. Now, currently, as a receptionist, to get paid $12 to $15 an hour as an entry level receptionist would be really good. So it was really good money. And I got hired and, and did the job. And as the receptionist, I had several roles that I was in charge of. One was the, um, the reception room, which makes sense. And so I would fill the appointment book when people would come in for their consultations, which here in, in our state at that time, you had to come in for an initial appointment and then return 24 hours later for your actual abortion appointment. And when the women would come, oftentimes they would come with a boyfriend or a husband or a partner, um, and they would go back in the back to have that consultation appointment. We were instructed to turn the heat extremely hot or turn the air conditioning extremely cold because we wanted the men to be uncomfortable and leave. 
because we knew that if she, if he would leave, she would come out and not feel supported and she was more likely to choose abortion. Um, there was a lot of other things that we may get into later, but the other piece that I was responsible for was the recovery room. And I, I often say that is the saddest place on earth because no matter whether a woman came in shouting her abortion or came in under you know turmoil with three kids in tow, in that room, all of the women are crying. And that, along with a lot of other things, after several months, I started to realize that we weren't actually helping women. And that's why I went there. I went there trying to get a good job, trying to help people. But I saw what was going on. I saw the manipulation. And I said, I don't want to do this anymore. And so I left. Um, it took me several more years of um, you know, using drugs, drinking, um, and was in a relationship. And it was a very violent relationship. And in the midst of it, um, we decided that it was time for me. I was going to leave where I was living um, because it wasn't working out. And we went out to have a last party, one last good time. And um, in the middle of the fight, there was a point where he was leaning over me and we had ripped the door frame down from the door. And so there was a two by four laying on the ground and he was leaning over top of me kneeling and he had the two by four in his hand and he was about to hit me over the head with the two by four. He drops the two by four, punches me in the face, blood goes everywhere and is like, oh gosh, I've actually really hurt her. And so the fight stops. Well, the next day I had text messages and phone calls from my father who lived 1200 miles away. And I of course didn't answer them because your dad's the last person you want to talk to in a, a moment like that. Um, got in a U-Haul and drove back to where my dad was, where my hometown is. And when I got there, my dad gets out and now mind you, my eyes are swollen. My nose is flat and crooked. And he looks at me and he starts crying and I get in the, the car with him and I'm like, oh, dad, I was in a car accident. He said, Kelly, two nights ago, I was asleep. And in the middle of the night, I was awoken by the Lord. And I had a vision of you laying dead on the floor with your head split wide open. And so I began to pray. And I realized in that moment that it was my father's prayers 1,200 miles away that had saved my life. So it took me a couple of weeks to sober up, to get my head straight, and I was sitting in the front pew of my dad's church, and I heard as clearly, clearer than I'm hearing you guys today, in fact, I heard God say, have you had enough? And it wasn't an angry, it wasn't, it was my father, God, saying, have you had enough? And I told him, you know, all the reasons that I wasn't worthy of his love. And, and then he said again, if you follow me, I will make beauty from ashes. Now, while I grew up a Christian, I didn't know that scripture, the Isaiah 61 scripture that he was actually speaking that to me. And, and I, you know, just was like, God, how are you going to make beautiful being molested as a three-year-old and raped at 12 and abortions at 15 and 17, you know, all the things, how are you going to make beautiful that? Well, I didn't hear anything that time. So fast forward several more years and I'm working at a pregnancy center um, a, a pro-life pregnancy center. And I told my story publicly for the first time. And as soon as I told my story, it was like, I knew that that was how God was going to make beauty from ashes was me telling my story and people getting hope. But there was a part of my story that I left out. I never would tell people the part about working in an abortion clinic. Because I could talk about the rapes, I could talk about the abortions, I could talk about the drug addiction, all the stuff, and people would feel sorry for me. But when I said that I worked in a clinic, there was that look, that shame, that, oh my gosh, I can't believe you did that. And so that was a part of my story that I didn't share. Well, then, fast forward a little bit further, and the movie Unplanned came out, which is Abby Johnson's story of being a Planned Parenthood clinic director. And I saw on the screen and it was like watching my own story, everything from the recovery room to her going to look for her file. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is an area that I've never gotten healing in. I need to get healing in this area so that I can tell my story better and, and just to be more healed. And so I went to the March for Life in January, right after that, which was 2020 and met the, the ladies with, and then there were none, told them a little bit about my story. And they welcomed me with open arms. And then in 
March, COVID hit. So it took a little while, but then October of that year, I came on as a client. And um, then in February, I got hired. And so I am the first, other than Abby, I am the first clinic worker to work for, and then there were none. Um, and I now travel with the ministry and share my story. And um, we also have a second ministry called Pro Love Ministries that is focused on those 15-year-old girls like me um, and giving them hope. So, yeah. So that's what I do now. And now I get to talk to people like you guys in Canada, which is so incredible. <laughs> So incredible for so many different reasons. And I am so appreciative of your courage in, in sharing that that testimony, because I'm sure that not only initially when you first started sharing your testimony, but even now, I'm sure as much as you may have grown in some areas of comfort in sharing this, it's profoundly personal and profoundly as much as, yeah, it might seem at times, I'm sure, as, as somebody else's story, when, when you reflect on it, you know that it's your own story. And I'm I'm curious, before we dive into these ministries that now you are allowing your testimony to, to change the lives of other families, that I my, my heart breaks when I see people, and, and it's come up even more now with the whole Supreme Court decision um, that's being mm -hmm. um, argued right now, and I see the two sides, as it were, and I see so much pain and anger and frustration amongst those in the in, in the pro-abortion movement, as it were, we see people who are taking the abortion pill on the steps of the Supreme Court as a mm -hmm. defiance and, and this anger. And I, I'm curious, as somebody who has, has experienced such profound um, kind of violence towards you and, and seen that kind of manifest in, in such harmful and, and painful ways, and now, by God's grace, having come through that, I'm, I'm curious, just just what goes through your mind when you see such kind of anger and pain from people advocating in favor of abortion? Do you see people who take this lightly and, and, and you know what, they, they kind of flipped a coin when they were in grade nine and said, oh, I'm actually gonna be a radical pro-abortion person. Or do you see people who may have gone through something similar to what you've gone through? And this is something of a coping mechanism for them or a different language. I, I know that's kind of a convoluted question, but just as this is kind of rearing its head in a very visible way for so many people, maybe for the first time, and there might be a spirit of those awful, terrible, wretched pro-abortion people that are going straight to hell and all this terrible stuff. What goes through your mind when you see these kind of these these acts that that pro-abortion advocates might be doing either at Supreme Court or other levels, I guess? Yeah, I've, I've actually been in the past couple of months, I've been to the Supreme Court three times. So I was there in October. I was there in November. And then I was here just recently in December. And there is such a stark contrast to the pro-choice versus the pro-life side. And even within the pro-choice movement, there is such a very difference in attitude and behaviors, some that are so, everything you talked about. I mean, it's demonic looking, you know, it is angry. It is the words that are coming out of their mouth, their facial expressions. It is full of rage and full of hate. And every time I see those people, I know without a shadow of a doubt, they've had an, had an abortion. 100% of the time, I, could, I would be willing to bet money that 100% of the time, those people have had abortions. Now, that's not to say that everyone that's pro-choice has had an abortion. But when you have those people with that rage and that anger and that hatred, I would say it's probably a 99 chance out of 100 that they've had one because they're covering up pain. And you've seen it so much lately in the media, even with the pro-choice side. This is a, you know, these are people that are advocating for abortion rights, but at the same time saying that abortion is traumatic and abortion is something that, you know, the, the Saturday Night Live skit that, that was such an abomination with the clown. But if you listened to the words that she was saying, she said, this is something I don't want to talk about, right? This is something that is my personal clown business that I don't want to talk about. And the reason she doesn't want to talk about it is because it's traumatic. You heard Alyssa Milano talking about the trauma from her abortions. You heard Gwyneth Paltrow and all these different stars that admit that abortion is traumatic. 
And so you have to cover that in some way, you know, you have to, and you can't go back and undo what's been done. And if you don't, you know, not to go super spiritual, religious weirdo, but if you don't believe in a forgiving God, and if you don't believe that God can forgive you, it's really hard to forgive yourself. And it's really hard to go through that. And so those people are reliving the trauma of their abortion. And something that with that, with that, something that Planned Parenthood has done a really good job of is this generation that's just below me. They are looking, so I'm in my 40s. I'm get, getting ready to be 45. Not to, I can't believe I just said that on air, but they're <laughs> younger than me. They are looking for something to live for and something to die for. They are looking for a cause to champion, a, a, a stand to promote. They want something to make them feel alive because social media has killed their being alive. You know, they don't have real interactions or anything. And so there you have these girls who are in crisis and they're in crisis and they come to Planned Parenthood and Planned Parenthood says, not only are we going to solve your problem for you, but you're going to leave here and you are going to have something to champion and a cause to stand for and a community of people to get around you and wear pink with you and tell everybody you've got a good side and a bad side. And it's such an obvious because if you're pro-life, then you're obviously bad. It's not something that's, you know, that's ambiguous. And now you've got a movement to be a part of and marches to join. And, and so these women are covering their pain in that. And they've done a really good job of that. And we see that. We see that in the messaging. The messaging that Planned Parenthood is doing is so smart, and you see it used to be safe, rare, and legal, right? You don't ever hear safe, rare, and legal anymore. You don't even hear it's a clump of cells. Remember we used to hear it's just a clump of cells? You don't hear that anymore. You hear abortion on demand without apology. Because we want to make abortion not a dirty word. We want to make it something that you're proud of. And so that's what you're seeing. You're seeing a side that is using trauma as a platform and that causes people to be angry and you know unfortunately as the pro-life side we have not done a good job of being loving we have not done a good job of advocating for the woman we've advocated for the baby from day one you know even you know diapers and wipes and baby showers that's that are wonderful that helps the baby that doesn't help the mom and so we are now changing, thankfully, and we are advocating for the moms and telling these women, you're better than this. You know, you're better than abortion. We have workers like myself coming out and saying abortion harms women. This doesn't help women. The fact that you could come in for a simple procedure and never be able to have children again, that's not helping women. Um, and so all of that together is why you see, but it is very obvious. I mean, there is no gray area. You can see it such a stark contrast from the pro-life side to the pro-choice side. It's, it's very interesting, in fact, to watch. Yeah, absolutely. It is, uh, I think you hit the nail on the head with the, um, you know, joining a movement and being part of something great. Um, when we see so many people, so many people, my generation, um, really, really joining Planned Parenthood in their messaging. I, I want to echo what Cam said as well. And thank you for sharing your story. I did have a few, there are a few thoughts that came to my mind um, when you were speaking. One of the, the most prominent sure. ones was, I guess, just thinking about your sort of response or reaction in life after your first abortion. You said you played tennis. You, you were you know, a top tennis player. You said you were top in school, but then you had your first abortion and you walked out of there. You stopped playing tennis. You stopped doing well in school. You started doing drugs. I wonder, looking back uh, on yourself and just reflecting on some of the choices you made and what went through your mind and some of the experiences that you had, what would you say was the cause of that such a massive transformation? Because what going back to Planned Parenthood's messaging and the abortion industry's messaging, that's not the messaging we're here. The messaging we're hearing is like, you can, 
you can remove this inconvenience from your life and continue to go on. And you mentioned the SNL clown skit. She said, I'm here because of my abortion, right? She, she was in this place of prominence. She was in this area, this arena where she could uh, receive notoriety and people could, could see her on Saturday Night Live. And she uh, credited that to her abortion. But you're saying, you know, something totally different than the messaging that we're hearing from the abortion industry and the media. So I'm just wondering, reflecting on those experiences, what was it that caused that massive transformation in yourself where you just really your whole life really changed around? Yeah, well, it's I mean, I knew that what I was doing was wrong. And so even at 15, I knew that it was I mean, I knew I was pregnant. I didn't think I had, you know, I didn't think I had a kidney stone. I knew I was pregnant. I knew I was pregnant with a child. You're, you're not pregnant with a kitten. And so I knew that I was ending the life of my child. And, but I didn't feel like I had any choice because I didn't want to disappoint my parents. I didn't want to ruin my college future. I didn't want to ruin my, you know, my tennis career. I didn't want to ruin all of these things. And so I felt like it was the only choice. But I ended up losing all of those things because of that choice far more than I would have if I'd had a child. And something that a lot of people don't understand with abortions is that the majority of people that have abortions go under a, a very heavy sedation. It's called a twilight sedation. At the clinic that I worked at, we charged $50 more to use heavy sedation versus not heavy sedation. So everyone chose sedation. With that twilight sedation, you not only don't feel the procedure, sort of, but you don't remember the procedure. And not only do you not remember the procedure, you don't remember the entire day. And so when people say it's not that bad, they don't remember being in the recovery room crying with a room full of women. They don't remember, you know, they don't remember. So it's like you walk in pregnant and you walk out not pregnant and you don't remember how that happened. And so that does a lot of things for the abortion industry. One, it makes it easy for people to say, well, it wasn't that bad because they don't remember it. You know, they don't remember the crying afterwards and, the, and those kinds of things. The other thing that it does is it covers up for when they make mistakes. So when they perforate someone's uterus or bowels or different things, they, which happens very often, it's one of the reasons I quit the industry, they take the woman back, they fix her up, they send her on her way, and they never tell her that there was a complication in her abortion procedure. And so, you know, all of those kinds of things are things that if women realized Abortion would be a lot more of a traumatic experience for them, but they don't because of that cocktail. You know, and the other thing is I, I really believe that because the because Planned Parenthood and the abortion industry has done such a good job of normalizing abortion and saying it's not that big of a deal. It's not something that you should feel bad about. It's your right. It's your body. It's your choice. After the fact, if you feel guilt or you feel something, you're like, something's wrong with me. I shouldn't feel guilt because it's okay. I shouldn't feel shame because they're saying that it's okay. And so I'm not going to speak up and talk about it. And it's probably just my hormones because, you know, your hormones have to re-regulate. You know, you, you, you give excuses as to why that's happening because you don't want to deal with the reality, which Everyone knows the reality. I mean, that to think people, maybe 20 years ago they didn't or 40 years ago they didn't. But nowadays, everyone knows what's happening. Um, you have to cover that somehow. And so with all of those factors together, that's how you do it. And again, as the pro-life movement, we have not done a great job coming alongside these women and saying, hey, clown, you can still be a clown and be a mom. <laughs> I have six kids. You know, I'm doing what I love to do. I travel. I have, you know, all these things. And I have six children. You can still go to school and have children. You can still, we have not done a great job of that. And, and that's where we need to make changes. And that's where we are making changes, thankfully, um, to change that narrative a little bit, because that is unfortunately a perception. 
Yeah. And, and that's where I'd love to dive next, Kelly, of, of how do we come alongside these mothers, these families, um, and offer better support? Because I feel like for a long time, pro-lifers have said, well, let's just throw as many diapers as we can at them. We'll, we'll fill them up with baby bottles and all this kind of stuff. But like you said, so often that is simply, yes, it might take some, some stress off of the, the family's mm-hmm. mind when it comes to paying for the materials of, of having a child. But it's not really touching on the emotional journey, the, the massive change. Like I, I feel like pro-lifers often also have this naive take of like, but it's just nine months. But as, <laughs> as a mom, and, and Peter, both you and I are dads, that having a baby isn't just something that changes your life for nine months. It's something that changes your life forever. For as long as you were on this earth, and I'm sure long after that as well, having a yeah. child is a profound difference. And I'd, I'd love to learn a little bit more about the ministries that you're doing and, and possibly starting with pro-love and, and how we as the pro-life movement can do a better job, especially in this, whether we want to call it the 11th hour ministry of people who are already pregnant and, and scared and in tough situations. How does pro-life ministries and, and the work that you're doing, how are we trying to better support mothers and families and not just focusing on the child. We don't want to forget about the child, but we need to have a more inclusive and not a different inclusive take. I, I would sometimes say, what are what are we doing right now? What should we be doing to better support these families? Well, 78% of women have abortions because they do not feel supported. They don't have financial resources or support. And so if we can eliminate that, 78% of abortions will go away. Um, and If a woman feels empowered and feels supported and feels encouraged, she will choose life, but not just, you know, and that's the other argument. Well, you just want them to be poor and have, you know, you don't do social service programs and things. No, I want these women to have an abundant life. I want them to go to school. I want them to continue their career. I don't want a bunch of families that are dependent on the government for making their wages. I want them to thrive, you know, not just survive. And So what we have found is that, yes, the diapers and the wipes are are great and very necessary. And parenting classes are wonderful and very necessary. But when I'm six weeks pregnant and I'm super sick with morning sickness and I need to take off work and so I can't pay my rent, who's going to help me now? Or if I want to continue going to school, but I need somebody to watch my child so that I can continue going to school, Who's going to help me now? And so with Pro Love Ministries, that is what we have done. Our goal, Abby Johnson, again, our founder, with, and then there were none as she was doing the pro-life, you know, getting involved in pro-life movement. She realized that there were a lot of gaps that were not being filled. And there are pregnancy centers who want to do more but don't know how or don't have the resources. There are sidewalk advocates who want to do more but don't know how and, and have the resources. And so she formed Pro Love Ministries. And we are actually an umbrella ministry. So we are made up of our individual projects and then also affiliates. Affiliates are separate 501c3s that are doing things a little bit different. So we have, for instance, an adoption um, agency, but they do not focus on the baby and the adoptive parents. They focus on the birth mom, the woman who gets forgotten, who got into this position because of a trauma. After her baby's gone to this new family in six weeks, she's right back in that trauma. So what are the chances you think that she's going to end up pregnant again? Pretty good. And so we want to support her so that that doesn't happen. Um, So one of our primary projects that is something that we have started is called Loveline. And so we are a 24-hour crisis line for women um, in the United States currently, but we are looking at other other locations. Um, and with that, what we do is we become basically the Christian social services. So instead of sending these women to government programs, which we're not against government programs, but we don't want the government to be her husband. We want the church to be her husband. And so we help connect her with local resources. And if we can't find local resources, then we become that resource. We get her a yes, because Planned Parenthood's telling her yes. 
And so we want to give her yeses. We want to say, yes, we will help you pay your rent. But not only are we going to pay your rent, we're going to give you a financial coach so that you can change these patterns and make better decisions. Yes, we are going to help you continue school, but we're also going to have you see a licensed counselor because we want to figure out why did you get yourself in this position in the first place. So we're going to help them along the way, but also try to change patterns and try to change things. And we don't do this for any certain amount of time. So if they need our help, for five years, we're going to be here for five years. Now, we haven't had anybody need it that long because with everything we're doing, they grow and they become independent, but there's no time limit. So as the pro-life movement, what we need to be doing is being resources for her. I mean, we are in many areas are a desert, a resource desert. There are no resources. So if she needs rental assistance or needs, you know, any car repair, something as simple as a car repair, there's no one there to help her. And churches should be doing it, but they are oftentimes overwhelmed with their own people in there, you know, with COVID especially, things have gotten really crazy. And so that is what we are trying to do. We are trying to Help find out why are you wanting to have an abortion? What are the real reasons that you are thinking that abortion is the best answer for you? Okay, how can we help change those reasons? And then be with you so that you don't go through this again. Fantastic. I, I absolutely love this. I love seeing this sort of work and really, yeah, being the, being the church to the child and being the church to the mother. I wrote the quote down that you just said, we don't want the government to be her husband that we want the church to be her husband, which is, is extremely profound. Now I do have a question because uh, Cam and I both work for an organization that does boots on the ground work that does boots on the ground outreach. And I know a lot of our listeners do that sort of outreach as well, where we go to streets, we go to high schools and colleges and we meet people at, uh, at door to door and in, in busy downtown pedestrian heavy areas. And, Often we are the first people that uh, are talked to when someone is in a, a situation like this. They don't know where to go. They're planning on having an abortion because they don't think there are any other options out there. They meet us and uh, and learn about some of the other options. I wonder, so the, the the advocacy for this sort of work is is vital and I love it. And I love seeing that there are more and more organizations popping up to provide the sort of support that you are uh, providing with Pro Love Ministries. But if we take a step back and, and look at a person like myself or some of my colleagues who are on the streets having these conversations, how can I navigate that conversation? What can I say? Where can I like, how should I direct them? Um, what should sort of that first contact be? And maybe like even speaking from your own experience um, with your own story, what would have perhaps been helpful um, if you would have met a, a, someone like me, someone like Cam or, or one of our colleagues uh, or friends across the country? Um for the very first time. And what would that first conversation look like? That would be the most helpful. So what you need to do is you need to find out what resources are available to you in your area, because inevitably the, the thought's going to be, well, you don't care about me. You just care about the baby. And then you need to tell her why that's not true and what, and you have to put money where your mouth is, you know? So it can't just be, Oh no, we, we love you and the child will prove it again. Who's going to pay my rent. Are you going to pay my rent? because I need help paying my rent. Well, no, I can't pay your rent, but we have this organization that would love to help pay your rent. And what, you know, so you have to arm yourselves with knowledge, knowledge. A lot of times also as pro-lifers, it amazes me how fearful people are of knowledge. Like I will call my local abortion clinic and ask questions Find out how much a procedure costs. Find out how far along they do the procedure. Find out what days do they do the procedure. Maybe even get the name of the receptionist. So if you're a person who prays, you can pray for that receptionist's heart. You know, find out information so that when these women are coming to you, you're not just speaking in hypotheticals, but you can tell them specifics. Do you know that a first trimester abortion is $650? And in that first trimester abortion, they're going to require you to have an ultrasound and have a pregnancy test, for instance. Did you know that we have a pregnancy center around the corner that will do your ultrasound and your pregnancy test for free? That will save you $250. And the girl might go, really? That'll save me $250? 
well, why wouldn't I do that? You know, like you've got to be creative and, and, and not just creative in like, but like, you've got to arm yourself with facts and resources. So find out what are the, what are the resources in your area for rental assistance? That's going to be a big one. Find out, is there an organization that helps girls who are still in school um, with watching their children in the United States, there's young lives, which does that. They have a group that gets together and does like a daycare so that the moms can work and can go to school. You've got to have those resources because when they ask you, you want to have the answer. Um, and if you don't, then you need to be ready with what you're going to do when they ask you. Um, because saying you're killing your child, although it's true, it's not helpful. And I will tell people this, you know, when I, oftentimes we will, as Christians and as pro-life people, we will tell them truth. Like, if you don't believe in Jesus, you're going to hell. Absolutely truth. But it's not helpful for me right now. If I'm in the ocean drowning and you're sitting on a boat and you're like, there are sharks out there. I know there are sharks. Right now I'm worried about me drowning hand me a life vest. So you've got to figure out what that life vest is. And in your conversations, that's what you want to be. You want to be full of hope. You want to be full of resources. You want to be able to give her yeses um, and connect her with organizations that can do that. Um, and, and that's, you know, going to be very different from place to place, area to area, that's going to be different. And so that's where we need to be doing our due diligence um, so that we can be more prepared. Because honestly, it's the only thing that might change her mind as a resource. The other thing is it's just got to be a change of heart. And, you know, a lot of times God's the only one that can do that. But sometimes a resource will buy you time and so that those things can happen. Absolutely. And and sometimes it's that companionship as well. I, I know there's been a number Absolutely. of people that I've spoken to here in Calgary, but all, also other communities. And, and I might not have all of those details at my fingertips, and I should. But even if I do, I'm, I'm sure that it's probably not going to be super helpful to just like, well, check out this website. They'll fix all your right. problems or like call this number, like to have some companionship of like, hey, do you want to go down to the pregnancy care center together? Like yes. I will give them a call right now and like let's let's speakerphone this so that you know that I'm in this and I'm not just gonna try to pawn you off on somebody else and then mm -hmm. at some point you're gonna fall between two stools and you'll be back at the steps of the abortion facility. I think that that having that information and also being willing to commit to like, yeah, you might not be in a position to adopt their child or pay their rent, but at least stick around long enough until they actually make contact with the person who can possibly. Um and, and so I, I think there's wisdom in that as well. I, I know that there's probably a ton more that we can say on this, but I'd love to change gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the, and then there were none ministry. Cause I, I believe that's obviously different. We've Peter, you and I, we've spoken to, I think three now, um, former abortion providers on this podcast mm -hmm. and, and each of them have cited, and then there were none in being instrumental in their not only transition, but recovery and being able to get involved in helping others. Share with us a little bit about, I, I know it's a, a different organization, but share with us a little bit about what's going on at, and then there were none, and maybe about how people can learn more and get involved with that. Cause I know that again, a lot of people have, in, in some ways, understandably so, very hard feelings towards those who are performing abortions or involved in the abortion industry. And yet, as we've heard from people like Maya Rodriguez and others, that for many people, this isn't out of a desperate urge to kill children, but rather out of a um, misconception. They've been lied to. They've been kind of almost blackmailed into this. Talk a little bit about what And Then There Were None is doing and how people can learn more about this ministry. Sure. So yeah. Uh, and then there were none is a ministry to abortion workers. So it is specifically to abortion workers. Um, we send um, different promo cards into abortion clinics. We also work with sidewalk advocates um, and do a lot of mailings and things to get our name into abortion clinics so that if there were workers that want to leave, they can come out. We never want finances to be a reason that somebody stays in the abortion industry. And it oftentimes is um, because like Myra, Myra Rodriguez, she was not a citizen. And they knew that and they brought her in and they basically held her captive, paid her very well and held her captive because of her 
immigration status. Um, for me, again, I was making $18 an hour when at that time I probably should have been making 10 or 11. And so I was stuck in this industry doing stuff that I did not want to do and was not qualified to do. Um, and I could tell you countless stories of workers who got hired to do one job and ended up doing something else that they were not qualified for, but because the money was so good, they stayed in there. So we don't want finances to be a reason that someone stays. We have over 600 workers who have left the abortion industry, uh, seven full-time doctors who've laid down their instruments, and 20, I think 26 clinics now that we can associate our workers leaving with the clinics closing. Because obviously, if a worker leaves, when workers leave, there's nobody there to work. Um, and so with that... It is a traumatic experience working in an abortion clinic, and we know that. And so we want to make sure that they're not only leaving the industry, but they're getting they're getting healing. And so we have a three phase healing process um, that you go through healing retreats. And with that, you are with other clinic workers and our counselor and Abby, and you get to talk through what you saw. And it's something very different about sitting in a room with other people that have experienced that and to be able to talk about what you went through and know that there's no shame. And when I say something, you're not going to, you know, you're going to go, oh my gosh, we called it the same thing, you know? Um, and so we do that. And then we also have a counselor who continues to meet with the workers. We also, again, do transitional finances. So we will help pay their bills from the time that they leave the industry until they find a new job. We have a resume writer who helps write resumes. Um, and we try to get them out of the abortion industry and into another job. And then ultimately our goal is to have them come to a saving knowledge of Jesus because we know that that's where the most healing comes from. Um, and we don't require that someone be pro-life to join our organization, but most everybody becomes pro-life eventually. Not everybody. We've had a few that... Um, you know, didn't that the money was too good and they went back or different things, but the overwhelming majority do. Um, and so we are very focused on that and we equip sidewalk advocates and we equip pregnancy resource centers on those conversations with abortion workers. That's one of my primary jobs. And then the other thing that we've started doing recently, um, is testifying to get pro-life legislation passed because, as somebody who has worked in a clinic, I can tell you that what Planned Parenthood is saying is not true. And I can tell you that we may say that we're doing this, but that's not what's actually happening. And so we have several of us that go and testify and help get um, pro-life legislation passed so that we can not only make abortion unthinkable, but also make it illegal. Um, and so we're trying to do it on all sides. You know, we're trying to get the workers out, keep women from going in, and we're trying to make laws so that people can't go in in the first place. Yeah, that's that's wonderful. And since you mentioned that you are the one that um, that helps with the uh, equipping people to have conversations with abortion clinic workers, I'd like to just touch on that uh, as we slowly start wrap this up for uh, as we slowly start to wrap this conversation up. Um, now, this is not something we're able to do in Canada unless we just meet an abortion clinic worker on the streets because we have these bubble zones and, uh, you know, going within a particular distance of an abortion clinic, um, I mean, is punishable by a fine or by jail time. But I know there are American listeners who do abortion clinic ministry. What are some tips that you might have for reaching out not only to the to the women uh, walking into the clinics like we've talked about, but to the clinic workers who are going into work, who are coming out for a smoke break, perhaps, or for lunch, and who are leaving? How can we interact with them as well? So anything that you are wearing, saying, or carrying should be a resource. And so abortionworker.com, um, you'd asked earlier about you know how people can get connected with the ministry. Abortionworker.com, they can go on and find out about it, and then there were none. So you could, if you put something up that says abortionworker.com, I bet you the abortion workers are going to check it out because they're going to wonder why the pro-lifers have that. And you never know, you know, you never know what might spark their interest. Um, and then, you know, the other thing is I would say just think about those women. Those women are your sisters. They are your daughters. They are your neighbors. Um, they are deceived and they most of them, I don't know anyone that joined the abortion industry because they weren't trying to help people. 
and they have a misguided view of that. And so treat them like you would want to be treated, you know, treat them like you would want your daughter treated and just talk to them with compassion and love and have resources. Again, you know, try to get them resources, which abortionworker.com is a great um, resource for that. Um, for prolove.com is actually now a landing page that goes to both ministries. So as a sidewalk advocate, you can have just prolove.com and that will then send them to either prolove ministries or, um, and then there were none. And, you know, just smile. And people are always like, well, it's a weird thing to smile outside of an abortion clinic. And yeah, that's true. But I don't want to walk up to somebody who's not smiling. And I don't want to talk to somebody who's not smiling. And so we can be, we can take serious what we're doing, but still have joy. And, you know, if you're going to be pro-life, look like you like yours. And, you know, in that, have a smile on your face. Um, it goes a long way. And just look at these women again, like you would your daughter or your sister, you know, and, and know that there's hope. There is hope for them. I am a testimony of that. There is hope that they can leave. And again, we've seen 600 workers leave and, and countless women not choose abortion. Um, and to the sidewalk workers that are out there doing it, y'all are amazing. You're amazing. You're making a difference. Thank you for what you're doing. We are seeing a change in abortion. We are seeing um, you know, abortion laws change and women turn away. So thank you so much for what you do because it's hard and it is not fun and it is, it is work and it is a battle. And so thank you so much for what you do. Absolutely. Yeah. We can echo that completely. And Kelly, thank you for what you do as well. You mentioned some of the links you mentioned prolove.com abortionworker.com mm -hmm. is it? And then there were none.com as well. Is that correct? Nope. So abortionworker.com okay. takes you to, and then there were none. So okay. yeah, if you go to prolove.com, that will then take you to either proloveministries.org, which is the pro-life, you know, they're both pro-life, but is the more umbrella ministry. And then that will also take you to, and then there were none. Okay. Gotcha. Perfect. We will have those links in our show notes. Is there anywhere else you would like to direct people for anything else? <laughs> no, I mean, I okay. think if you go there, you know, um, that, that's going to give you most everything. Amazing. Perfect. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us. This has been a fantastic conversation. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. That was Kelly Lester of Pro Love Ministries. And, and then there were none. Cam, I'm going to ask you in just a moment what uh, maybe like a final thought that you had or a reflection that you might have based on the conversation is one of the things that stuck out to me, sir, was the, the line that she said, we don't want the government to be her husband. We want the church to be her husband, her being obviously uh, those women in the difficult crisis situations. And I think that's key. I think that's a calling for the church um, not to hand over responsibility uh, that we've been given by God to the government or to, to someone else, but to step into those dirty and those messy situations and be the light that we need to be. What are some reflections that you have, sir, as we wrap this up? Yeah, as I mentioned in the episode, I just profound amount of respect and appreciation for Kelly and her courage in sharing this testimony and, and inviting others to prayerfully consider their own engagement. That that I, I've mentioned this a few times already this year, um, that the pro-life movement needs more broken people. And what do I mean by that? But, um, but the fact that we are all broken people and that there's too many people who are sitting on the sidelines because of their brokenness, because of the decisions and choices that they've made already. And I'm sure that it wasn't easy for Kelly to get up and share her testimony for the first time, nor for the second time, nor for the, the thousandth time that, that she's sharing with us today, that um, the, the vulnerability that goes into sharing that. And, and maybe you're a broken person. Maybe you have had an abortion. Maybe you have shared with some of the, the hardship that um, Kelly mentioned today, and you feel as though you don't want to sully the pro-life movement or you don't want to embarrass the pro-life movement or anything like that, please throw that in the garbage. We absolutely need you. Whether you share your testimony like Kelly or not, um, we don't ask people when, when they come out to activism whether or not they have um, 
ups and downs in their past. There, there's no filter to you have gone through a hard life, you have made decisions that you now um, wish that you hadn't, all that sort of thing. There's no quiz for whether or not you get to do pro-life outreach. We need more broken people in the pro-life movement because everybody is broken and we simply need more people in the pro-life movement. So if you feel like you have been sequestered to the sidelines because of your own brokenness, because of decisions that you've made, please get in touch with us. And whether that's connecting with a post board of healing ministry, whether that's connecting with other kind of counseling and support programs to help you with whatever you're going through, um, please don't view your brokenness as a barrier or obstacle to getting involved in the pro-life movement. We need people like Kelly sharing their testimony. We need other people who may privately hold their decisions in their hearts and don't share it publicly. Um, but we simply need more people in the movement. So please prayerfully consider how you can further engage. And if you're broken, you're just like Peter and I. And so don't let that be a barrier to you. That's right. That's a, a great way to wrap this up, sir. Thank you for that. My name is Peter, host of the show. That's Cam, the co-host. We'd like to invite you once again to join us as a patron of the Pro-Life Guys. There's some cool merch that uh, you'll have access to, like this water bottle here, which is currently my favorite water bottle. Um, Cam, you got something? Yeah, there you go. Um, for those of you who are listening to this, you can find out what sort of merch we have at prolifeguys.com slash shop. Um, and for all of you who are listening or watching, please hit that subscribe button. Please hit that notification bell. And if the app you're on allows you, please give us a five-star review. If we're worth a zero-star review or a one-star review, just maybe put that one-star review on a piece of paper um, and not on the app itself. But um <laughs> Um, do give us a, a good review because that helps us to reach more people and it, it it shows the algorithm that you are enjoying the content that we are putting out. You can reach out to us on our website, prolifeguys.com with any questions or concerns or suggestions or feedback or whatever it might be. You can also find us and follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Just search the Pro Life Guys podcast or at Pro Life Guys podcast and you'll find us there. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. We hope you tune in again next time. Mm -hmm.